All right, let's get started. So our next panel is called Masterclass, Managing a True Corporate Crisis Major Internal Investigation. And we have the A-team here. This is going to be a, a great panel. Um, let me introduce everybody briefly. Um, fourth down here is Bill Baker. Bill's a partner in the Washington, D.C. Office of Latham & Watkins, former associate director in the SEC's Division of Enforcement, where he worked for 15 years. Uh, right to my left, Brad Bondi is the moderator. He's a partner at Paul Hastings uh, in Washington, D.C. And Brad formerly served as S at the SEC as counsel to two SEC commissioners for enforcement actions and regulatory rulemaking. In the middle is Sandra Hanna. Uh, Sandra's Wall Street Journal picture is not up there because we had some moving parts, but Sandra Hanna is, uh, is on this panel, thank goodness. And uh, she's a partner at Miller and Chevalier in D.C. Uh, prior to joining Miller and Chevalier, she spent nine years at a premier SEC enforcement boutique law firm that she co-founded. Um, at the end is Haima Marlier, partner at Morrison Forster in the New York office, uh, previously served for over nine years at the SEC where she was senior trial counsel. And finally, uh, two over, Bill McLucas, a uh, partner at Wilmer Hale and previously served for more than eight years as director of the SEC's enforcement division. Brad, let me turn it over to you. Terrific. Thanks, Bruce. Um, this is going to focus on uh, managing a true corporate crisis and a major in internal investigation. I want to start by kind of thinking about what to do when a crisis hits and then talking about how to best position the client and then conclude with some closing thoughts from the panelists. So let, let me start with Bill McLucas. Bill, you have extensive experience representing companies in high stake, stakes matters, including, of course, your famous representation of the special committee of Enron's board of directors. When you're hired in a crisis situation, what are your first steps to diagnose the matter and to assess the situation? Well, I mean, the, the first thing you're trying to do is figure out, is this existential and franchise threatening, or is it the ordinary problem that most companies face at some point during their, their life cycle? And then how you do that is, you know, you look to the general counsel, first of all, for information. And the more severe the problem, sort of the more compressed the time period is for you to at least get an initial assessment are we talking about something that literally is uh, existential, or are we talking about a problem where we're going to have to manage it, deal with the regulators, figure out the solution, and get from here to there? And so your, your initial uh, effort really is directed at sizing up what we're dealing with. If we're dealing with a uh, BP oil pipe leak into the Gulf type situation that's existential, you're going to size that, you're going to learn that pretty quickly. Then your approach is a lot more immediate and dramatic and you're going to have to figure out who's going to be in control. Uh, are we talking about a special committee, audit committee? Are we talking about an independent review? Or are we talking about simply managing to defend the company and the franchise? against the array of regulatory inquiries and, and, and DOJ inquiries that you're going to face. So that's sort of the day one, the day three, you know, challenge you have. And um, it becomes pretty apparent quickly whether we're dealing with a regular problem or something that's a little more dramatic where you're going to have to worry about survival of the enterprise and massive liability. And, and Bill, assuming that it is a major investigation and it involves the audit committee or a special committee, what are the first things you're telling that audit committee or special committee uh, once that's underway and set up? Well, you need uh, lines of reporting. I need to know who's going to be the control person for access to data, electronic <coughs> communications, the database. We need a document preservation order that gets sent out. There's usually tension between uh, the scope and how many people get that order and your concern about possible documents being deleted or people doing stupid things. And people in these situations always do stupid things. That's sort of expectation number one. But your first order of business is uh, reporting 
lines. Is it a committee? Better if it's a committee, because if you have a board of more than eight people, meetings, reporting get much more challenging, especially early on, and eight people can't agree on the color on the, on the wall. Better to have three people to make decisions. And then the uh, issue is going to be educating them about what you're going to have to do. Document preservation, access to the electronic data system. Who in-house can you rely on? What's the reporting responsibility? Um, they're going to be reporting to you. You're not going to want people reporting up the chain of command to their normal supervisors, depending upon the problem, because whether it's an accounting problem, an operational issue, uh, if, if the company has $100 million of revenue that suddenly comes up missing, you're going to have to control the communication uh, up the normal chain of command through the accounting and controller's office because this is something you don't know on day one whether it implicates senior leadership, just controls, a bad employee, an accounting glitch, and you have a lot of um, moving pieces depending upon the issue, but the first thing you got to do is establish an understanding as to uh, who's going to control the process, who's going to be the point of access so you know who to go to, and then controlling the information, preserving the documents, and making sure people understand this has now moved into serious business and, and, and a misstep can complicate things dramatically. <clears throat> Sandra, when do you start thinking about advising your client on self-reporting? I start thinking about it right away. Uh, and part of it depends on how it came in. If there is a whistleblower complaint, that certainly affects the calculus. Not everybody agrees with me on this, but I'm of the view that if we got a whistleblower complaint, they went online to sec.gov and f filed a form TCR, because why not? The potential for payout is so high, right? We saw in, in Ericsson 200 something, almost $300 million payout to a single whistleblower. So why wouldn't they do that? Um, so the calculus changes when you have a, a, a whistleblower. Bill Baker and I can debate this about the value of self-reporting. Um, I think there's still value, particularly when there's a, a, a whistleblower um, of going in and trying to pick the staff that loves you and trusts you, at least. They won't give you any breaks, but they'll, they'll trust what you're saying. Um, there, there is some value in that. And if we're really talking about a crisis, like a crisis crisis, they're going to find out anyway. There's, there's no way that they don't. So uh, in that situation, you probably want to get a, a, ahead of it. Um, there is reasonable people can debate the value of self-reporting and cooperation credit and what that means, and, and I'm sure we'll talk about it here throughout the day. Um, but we've seen some cases that show there is value, and certainly on the DOJ side, they have made public statements suggesting that there's value. Um, and we've seen a little, a little bit of, of value from that. Um, not enough. <coughs> But if you're talking real big BP spill, um, I would get ahead of it. The problem is if it's on the front page above the fold more than one day, yeah. self-reporting is sort of, it's an afterthought because they already know. Right. Yeah, they know, but I think there's still value in the staff viewing you as credible and cooperative yeah. and transparent in their in their process, right? We've certainly, I've had that experience with the staff um, on multiple occasions. It doesn't mean that we got the result that we wanted from the, a settlement or whatever the final order was, but uh, the, the process was less painful. Bill Baker, when, when an audit committee or special committee asks you, what is the value of self-reporting, are you able to explain that? It, you know, it's challenging. I, it, it, in a situation like that, at least in my experience, the board wants to know how long is this going to take, what's it going to cost, and what's the end result. Um, and on day one, you almost n never know the answer to those questions. You can give a rough approximate. If, if I have 10 witnesses and, and you know, 
20 gigabytes of data, and it's going to cost X. Um, the timing is entirely dependent on A, whether there is a government investigation, um, and, and by the way, these things never arise at the beginning of a quarter. They, they always happen with a week to go before you have to file your queue, yeah. um, and you're not going to get the investigation done on time, so you've got to put something out there which is going to trigger a public disclosure, which in turn um, uh, uh, will almost certainly gather the interest of the SEC. Um, I, I'm of a view that if you publicly disclose, that's self-reporting. If the SEC can't be bothered to read the paper, then yeah, and, yeah, that's on them and, and not on... Uh, How's that argument go over? When you very it? well. It's always very well received, Bill. And, and then what staff do you get? Well, there, there is that, although I, I've also learned that you, know, you, can, um, you can pick your audience initially, but that doesn't mean that there's somebody in Washington or elsewhere who's going to run the whole thing and not pay any attention to sure. you know, when you came in. And it, it's going to depend on, is it an environmental matter? Is it an uh, ESG matter more broadly? That, then that's going to get the attention of Washington. Is it a crypto matter? Yeah, um, if it's a, just a run of the mill, and it's weird to talk about run of the mill accounting problems, you're probably not going to get that same level of, of attention. But it, when the board asks, you know, what value do we, will we get for cooperation? Unfortunately, all you can do is point to the seaboard uh, factors, which have been around for 20 years. If you're at, if it's a case where there's a criminal component, I can look at the sentencing guidelines, and I can look at, at the various iterations of, of memos that have followed and say, look, here's how we get from X to Y, and there's certainly wiggle room in there, but the SEC has, for 20 years, declined to provide any more detailed uh, analysis other than to say, look, sometimes we, we will waive a penalty. Hama, you're the newest member of the defense bar from from the SEC joining, what, two years ago, three years no, ago? No, almost four now. <laughs> almost the, four the years The pandemic ago. has made everyone's time a little funnier. <laughs> what are you telling clients about the value of self-reporting from your more recent experience at the SEC? I actually agree with a little bit of what everybody said. Um, I would also bring in the compliance um, component. I think organizations with really strong compliance programs, depending on the type of crisis that hits, to, to Bill's point, can sometimes, um, you can sometimes get them more comfortable with self-reporting because they have that strong compliance function and it's operated the way that it should. And let's say you have, for example, an accounting crisis or something that is not going to, that you, that you think may not draw the same level of attention as some other topics, that becomes an easier um, conversation. Um, and then I think you really need to walk them through what does self-reporting mean? Like, what is that process going to look like? And I think what the SEC is going to be looking for is compliance. So what's the, what self-policing is going on already in the organization? Did you self-report um, remediation? And what's the quality of your cooperation? And I think all of that, you have to very carefully counsel all the relevant stakeholders through, because it's, it's cooperation is not just one phone call or, or you know, picking one person and having one meeting. It is this very lengthy, often years long process that um, everyone has to sort of buy into. Now, now sticking with you, but shifting to the idea of communicating publicly, oftentimes companies want to hire outside communication firms. They want to manage the message. Um, how do you quarterback a communication strategy and What's the appropriate role for you as an outside counsel? So I think that a good communication strategy starts before you ever have a crisis. All, organ all organizations are going to have a crisis, some of them, um, and hopefully they don't rise to the level of a BP um, oil spill or something that does make it above the fold on the front page of the paper. So um, you need a really strong crisis management plan, and within that crisis management plan is a communication sort of flow and policy so that when, um, when the crisis happens and it sort of feels like the house is on fire, you have your set of instructions right in front of you to get those things in place. 
As far as who should quarterback, it really varies. Um, often it's um, an internal member of senior management um, who is the speaker, a public relations officer, or someone like that, often has communications flow through them. There needs to be a really, really strong role for the GC and for outside counsel. Those two functions, GC and outside counsel, um, are to ensure that everyone has the salient facts for the communication, and also, most importantly, to manage risk. Um, and to constantly sort of assess, you know, risk along the way as you're communicating. And, and Bill Baker, <clears throat> you've dealt with this in major investigations. How do you strike the right balance bef between saying too much and, and, and yet also being transparent to the public? Yeah, um, it, it is a challenge uh, because A, you've got disclosure obligations, um, B, um, the, the company's almost always going to want to go out and say there's no problem here or the problem is managed. And if the problem is managed, fine. But I talk to people and say, well, when the SEC takes your investigative testimony and they put this statement in front of you, how, what are you going to say that um, you relied on in making that statement? Was it just, you know, atmospheric or, or and that generally focuses people when they think about testifying at deposition or at um, uh, uh, an investigative testimony. I, my experience is that uh, it's pretty challenging to get the IR function in line, which is used to responding immediately, um, and thinking about different stakeholders, the uh, auditors, shareholders, customers, and just drawing out what can we say to each of what do these groups need to know and what can we say to them and that in turn out, consistent with our reg fd obligations how is that going to drive our, our public disclosure um and uh, I, I i think you've got to do a lot of education about the repercussions of putting out statements that that you don't have a solid factual basis for yeah. I, I totally agree with that. I, th I think we spent, we defense counsel spend a lot of time, um, wasted time, frankly, managing the crisis comms people who always want to say too much when particularly in the early days, we don't know anything. Um, and it is, it is a frolic and detour that I, I, Bill is rolling his eyes. Um, no, no, no. I, what I'm thinking about is how the, all the friends you make when you keep saying, no, you can't do right. that, no, you can't do that, it, it really uh, endears you to the right. corporate uh, management. And, and you really need to put someone on the IR person full time just to say no. Right? That, that, that's personally, I, if it's a real crisis, I advise them to bring in somebody who's been through this uh, fire drill before. The in-house people can be excellent, but their job has generally been while trying to be accurate, putting a, a smiley face on everything that goes yeah. out. Happy time. They don't have the objectivity, and they report up the chain of command. I want somebody that we will hire. I want the lawyers to retain the outside crisis management communications firm because I'm going to be talking to them, and it's got to be privileged. I don't want a subpoena for everything I said to the to the. Uh, the mm -hmm. PR people, but that's the value because they can walk into the boardroom, the audit committee, and say, "You can't do this." And and if they, get, you know, these are firms and people who have been through uh, crises before, and their view is, "That's what you pay me for. If you want to fire me, fire me." That's my best advice, and and that it, it alleviates the conflict that the in-house people have, who are basically trained to please. Right. How do you I, deal the with people who do that well, Bill, or actually, it's a very, very, very small group of outside. I haven't clients. met any, but you're right. <laughs> I, I... How do you deal with a client, Bill, that either Bill that that wants to have off the record and background conversations with reporters and want to try to massage the message out there? How do you deal with that when you're dealing with a, a major investigation going on in the background? Diplomatically, but directly, and you just say, "Look, first of all, if they're off the record and the, and you're not told about them, you got a problem because you can't go in and accuse your client. On the other hand, if you know what's going on, 
You just got to go in and say, you can't do this. You can't do it. And, and the government's not stupid. They know it's not <clears throat> coming to the reporter in a dream. And the assumption is it's coming from the C-suite. And you can't, and, and, you know, sometimes that doesn't go so well. But that, they, it, all it takes is one time when the government calls and says, who, who said this? Um, and uh, when they realize their statements are on the radar of the U.S. Attorney's Office or the front office of the SEC, that, that has, goes some way to shutting people down. Uh, more challenging is when leaks are coming out of the government side and there's reading adverse press and, and how do we respond to that? And there's not a lot you can do. And that, and that causes enormous frustration by the client because they get crazed. And even when it's not a leak from the government, the, the tendency is to say, to blame the government. It must have come from the government. Who else would know this? And, <laughs> you know. Bill uh, McLucas, sticking with you and shifting to the early stages of initiating an investigation, how do you deal with a circumstance where a company, maybe the management team, and even the board itself says, we really don't want to elevate this and make a big deal out of this. Let's just have management oversee the investigation. It doesn't need to be an independent investigation. How are you convincing them when it's appropriate that it needs to be an independent investigation? I, I think post uh, Enron, WorldCom, and a whole series of cases in the past, your uh, constituency really are the independent directors because directors now and the boardroom generally is far more sensitive to reputational damage in their own name. And uh, the, it, it may be a reasonable judgment for management to say, we don't need an independent review by 100 lawyers running all over the company. In some cases, that's a fair judgment. It's a problem. We're going to deal with it, and then we'll defend. But if you have a serious crisis that is franchise threatening. Your best shot at minimizing the government fallout, in my view, is retain somebody who's got credibility, who's going to do it soup to nuts, who's going to lay it out for the government. It's going to come out anyway. And you may not like what you hear, and you may not like the ultimate outcome, but at least it's more likely than not you're going to save money, you're going to get to the end sooner rather than, than, than later. And remember, in the markets, finality is usually the objective. Something happened. It was bad. We don't know how bad. Were there two bodies in the closet or three in the basement? <laughs> or was Something bad happened, but can we just get it over with? And so my view is, if you look at the course of SEC and DOJ investigations, and you don't have the ability to try to move from here to there quickly, it's more of a drag on the, on the markets, on the business, on the executive team, and the, the, the goal ought to be get it out, get it out all at once, deal with it, move on. Yeah. And that, that's what you say to management, and that's a hard message, and a lot of folks look at you and say, but we did nothing wrong, you're crazy. But, but that's also, it's also the most protective thing of management, right? If, if management is really not wrongdoers here, having independent audit committee review of this is the best way to convince people that management is, right. is innocent. You may have a control issue. Maybe yep. you got a, a bad person. Now, you may have management may have gotten a B minus instead of an A plus in terms of oversight and control. But, as long as you don't have a C-suite person implicated right. in, in the underlying issue, uh, you're right. The, the best thing is to get through it, get it out, and get it over with. Sandra, these investigations can be very costly for companies. Any advice to the audience of <clears throat> balancing cost and disruption um, and messaging that to the yep. audit committee or the special committee? Um, it's a good question. I think there are actually very few cases that require boil the ocean exercises. Um, 
I would spend time on the front end trying to understand what happened, scoping interviews, that sort of thing, and at least as a preliminary matter, um, engage in focus and targeted review as opposed to collecting 50 or 100 custodians. Um, and you can do that with no prejudice to the government or your investigation. It's just a matter of determining priorities. And maybe in the first 10 custodians, you have enough, or 20, and you don't need to have a broader um, you only go broader when you need to. And, and not everybody has that instinct, and certainly there are times when a boil the ocean approach is necessary, but very rarely, I think. You, you really ought to try to understand things. Take the extra two days on the front end and try to understand the scope of what you're dealing and what departments are affected and who, what's, it's always the salespeople, right? Like what salespeople are actually involved and what level it goes down to. And you can always go broader. But once you um, have, you can't unring the bell when you start with 50 custodians. Mm -hmm. And also just to add on to that quickly, I don't know how much more mileage that gets you with the SEC in your cooperation hmm. program. Um, I feel like within the SEC, arguments made about um, the, co the, the amount of dollars spent on an internal investigation, those rarely push the needle um, towards you know, getting a more favorable outcome for the company. So I would definitely second what, what Sandra just said. Picking up on that point, though, what are you telling an audit committee or a special committee of what does push the needle with the SEC staff in terms of what needs to be done? I think any gaps in evidence, I think any evidence that's weak um, really does push the needle, even with a very aggressive and committed SEC. So if you take that time up front, try to understand what the crisis is, and then come up in the very early stages with a very simple, almost like an order of proof, like if I were at the SEC, these are the things I would be looking at, then you can start to assess what you're getting out of your independent investigation. And when you come to realize, okay, this is a run-of-the-mill crisis, there's not even negligence here, let alone fraud, I think communicate, communicating and, for, and um, presenting the evidence that way, kind of early to medium on, can really, really help. Speaking of communication, Bill Baker, how often do you suggest at the start um, to an audit committee or special committee that you update them or brief them on the investigation? Is it, is it every day? Is it every week? Is it once a month? How's, how's that determined and when? It's almost never once a month. And uh, I, I mean, again, you're on a clock. If, if it's a true existential crisis, it, it, it may be daily. Um, if you're doing interviews and, and um, learning new things every day, you don't want your client to be surprised by something they read in the paper or something that they hear from somebody else outside of the investigation. So I, it, it's fact specific, but um, Plus, you want those people engaged and understanding what the conduct was, what the repercussions are. So I, I'd say, you know, at a minimum weekly, probably uh, more frequently than that, if, if developments warrant it. I think the, the other key constituency that you're going to have to update are the auditors. And I didn't mean to get ahead of you, but that's, they're going to drive the scope of the investigation. If it involves or touches on accounting issues or, or disclosure issues or that touch on accounting, they're going to um, have strong views on the scope and they'll want to know in reasonably real time what's going on. Yeah. And with an independent investigation, Bill Baker, are you interacting at all with the management in terms of what you're finding? Are you having open communications with the management or are you cutting things off? Yeah, that's at the direction of whoever's overseeing the investigation. If it's the board, and if with respect to senior managers, they're not implicated, um, it's tough not to update them. Um, they're trying to run a business, and if there are people that they can't rely on, they should know that quickly. Um, and so I would say, on the other hand, if, they're, if it's their conduct that's directly implicated, um, they may have their own lawyer. You can figure out ways to convey information that way. 
but um, I, you don't want to be reporting the results of your investigation to someone um, whose conduct is directly implicated in that investigation. Yeah. Shifting to what to do during an investigation and keeping things on track, uh, Bill McLucas, once the investigation is ongoing, what are some of the things that you've seen that could derail or threaten an investigation, and how do you cut those off? Well, the, 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 the threshold issue is preservation of old documents, and I, you, we covered that. You get a directive at it. it inevitably, depending upon the character of the problem, people get their own lawyers, which you know is a smart thing to do. Uh, and one of the challenges in these things is the delay. I got, I got, I haven't had time to prepare. I need the documents. What are you going to? Uh, and you, you try to manage that reasonably, and you try to give. I, I'm pretty candid with people about these are the areas we're going to cover. I mean, it's not a mystery. It's not a, a, uh, providing documents. Probably, generally not. You're, you're, I, I wouldn't think that's necessary. And these are employees, they have responsibilities to the company, and they've got to cooperate with the investigation. They also, though, I think it's fair to say, if they have concern about exposure and they want a lawyer, they gotta, the lawyer's got to have time to at least sit with them, work with them. <coughs> you try really to be reasonable about it, to the, but not to the extent that three months in, I can't brief uh, substantively the audit committee or the regulators or the auditors because uh, Joe in accounting is not ready to talk to me. I mean, you get to the point where you say, look, you're either going to come in and talk or you're not. If you're not, it's fine. We're going to go talk to the audit committee. And if you have a job tomorrow, you do. Maybe you'd be put on leave. But usually you can get people there. When people won't come around, it's either because they have real exposure or they're getting bad advice. And you get all kinds of lawyers retained in these cases, depending upon the company you're involved with, whether you get pool counsel. But somebody who does real estate settlements will be advising his brother-in-law. <laughs> and there's nothing more frustrating because you're, you know, you, you can't educate somebody in, in, in the space of one of these internal investigations about why they should use some common sense. <laughs> Sandra, anything else to add to that? Um, I, I agree with Bill and think now, in the last year, we have seen document preservation notices go to individuals directly very early in the investigation. Um, and once you know that has happened, I would early on get pool counsel to avoid the my cousin Vinny situation Bill's talking about. Um, and that's a, I mean, I think that was always true, but it's particularly true now when you have the government seeking personal devices right away, or at least preservation of per personal devices. And, and are you seeing issues arise often with off-channel communications, signal, and and yes, all the things all the time. Messages. Yes. H how do you deal with that in an independent investigation? So the tech has actually gotten pretty good in the last year. I just had a case where we were able to recover deleted text messages, not signal, that's a whole other trap. Um, but if that is really, if you're concerned about deletions of iMessages, the tech is caught up. But that is always a concern and frankly goes to collecting devices earlier um, rather than later. I'm also seeing our clients, big corporate clients, get pretty sophisticated on their uh, bring your own device policies and permitting, um, you know, subject to privacy laws and all of that, permitting um, capturing a person's individual phone as necessary for the business. So, it, so that's good. I mean, if they didn't have the new policies in place, and I think the DOJ policy changes on the CEP has really driven much of that, um, then we would be in a much different position. But companies are catching up and following the DOJ's advice, and that enables us to collect phones in a way that we couldn't before. I, I want to ask each of you this question, um, and we can start with Bill Baker and go, go down the, the other way. How do you advocate for your client while also maintaining independence? 
when you're going in to report to the SEC and you see areas, because you may deal with a special committee and an audit committee that says, look, I hope you put this in the best light when you present this to the SEC. How do you do that? How do you do that effectively while also maintaining the independence? Well, I think it starts um, with a balanced presentation to if the client is the audit committee or a special committee to educate them. Uh, it's not always true, but the facts should drive the result. And it, laying that out for them first, and then um, I think it's soft advocacy, presenting the facts unvarnished, because the SEC is gonna, or, or whatever government agency is gonna find that out. They're, they're gonna look through what's produced, they're gonna come to their own judgment on it. So I think if you're doing a presentation on an independent investigation, the best thing you can do is present it warts and all, um, and, not, uh, uh, and not try and cut any corners. Um, that's really, at that point, the best advocacy. When you move to the potential enforcement action, I think you can be a lot more vigorous in the way that you present the matter. Your thoughts from your recent experience mm -hmm. at the SEC? Um, uh, what, what's worked? What hasn't? What has backfired when you've seen people come in so and try to that, advocate too much? Things that have backfired is um, anything um, bombastic or overly aggressive the staff does not take too kindly to. They've done their own work. You know, they have their view of the facts. I would say just stick to the facts, ma'am, you know, when you, um, when you present in there. Um, other things that um, I, I really want to pick up on, on what Bill said, because I think it's important. I think you go through that first with your client, whether it's an audit committee client, whether it's an individual client. Just you know, have a call where you walk through, take the hour or so, and say, this is what it's going to look like when we talk to the SEC. Often clients, what's really important to them is not going to move the needle with the SEC staff. So you don't want to waste too much of your you know, sort of half an hour, hour long meeting with the staff on things like, oh, this is going to damage the company's reputation or my reputation. Oh, this is going to hurt our stock price. This is going to make us lose customers. Those are all things that are incredibly important to clients, but don't necessarily move the needle in that meeting. And I think having that conversation with the client can make them see that you are well prepared and how the approach you're planning to take, where you're just going to focus on the facts, focus on the evidence, and try to minimize the damage as much as you possibly can, or even push the SEC off bringing a case at all, I think that can go a long way. Bill, anything to add? No, I think Bill Baker had it right. If it's truly an independent investigation, my advocacy is limited to the integrity of the process. Mm -hmm. This is what we did. This is how we did it. This is what we found. Uh, we didn't pull any punches. If you have any questions, happy to answer. If you want the audit committee to come in, you want the independent committee. Sometimes I've had the committees actually go in and meet with the staff. If you're going to transition to advocating for the solution or the settlement, first, I wouldn't do that unless the client requested it, and then I called the staff and said, the client has requested that we participate in a discussion about what this means. We've given you the facts. We've given you the record. I can't, I can't spin it. So now the issue is a debate about what does it all mean. If the staff is comfortable with that, we would do it. If the staff says, no, 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 we think that would impair your independence, I'm inclined to tell the client, we, this is going to reflect badly on you. It's not going to be effective. You know, you can, we could do that anyway, but I think that if the staff is skeptical or expresses a concern, it hurts the client to push that envelope. Sandra? Uh, has that happened to you? Has the staff said, you know, your counsel to the audit committee, you shouldn't be involved in settlement discussions? They've said a lot of mean things, but not that. <laughs> uh, uh, no, and, and, and I have, though, gone to them in advance in a case that was, you know, uh, a two-year investigation, very serious implications, and um, <clears throat> They deliberated and came back and said, we're fine if you guys want to come in with company counsel. Um, mm -hmm. um, but I think that the, the best outcome is when the staff actually 
walks away thinking, we got it. Maybe we would have taken this witness or maybe we would infer from this evidence, this fact. But generally speaking, we got a pretty good record here of what, the, what happened. And at least we have confidence that we're not being sold a, a, you know, a bill of goods or we're not being spun here. That's the best you can do in these things if you're really good. And at the end of the day, it saves the client money, time, lawyers. And as I said, I think in 90% of these situations, the, the biggest objective is get to the end. Get it over with, get it out, move on. You know. But the, but the, your point about the integrity of the process is a really critical one, not just for audit committee counsel, but for company counsel too, right? The staff should have the view that company counsel played it straight down the middle and was transparent about the process and what they did and didn't do and what their findings are, were, the facts are just the facts, right? And then you can argue, well, what does it mean? Or we disagree with you on this, but even assuming yeah. you're right, we did all this for you, you're going to you know, uh, uh, lop off my little finger, do you need the whole hand? And, and, and though that's where the argument devolves to. You're trying to get the best deal you can for the client. And the most important thing there is, do they think they're being spun or, or do they think that, they, they, you know, do you deserve to go back to the original point credit for having at least saved the government the time and the uh, effort of doing the investigation, and you, and you got it to them quickly. We've got only about three minutes left on the panel, so I want to make sure everyone gets some closing remarks here. Um, Bill, what would you give to uh, uh, advice to a new defense lawyer about independent investigations, about managing crisis? What are your big talking points, if you would say? What are the big pieces of advice that you wish somebody had said to you as a junior lawyer that you know now from your experience? Um, by the time I left the government, I was never a junior lawyer, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, I, I think the hardest thing when you go into one of these things is CEOs and uh, directors, many of whom have been CEOs, are used to being in control. And they're used to telling you what to do and when to do it. And when they're not happy, life's miserable. And I think the hardest thing to do is to develop the uh, fortitude and then the style to be able to deliver bad news and to be able to say no. I, 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 I hear you. I, I, I had an uh, internal review where we were 60% of the way through it. Audit committee invited the CEO in. We did a briefing. 20 minutes into it, he said, all right, I've heard enough. We know where this is going. Wrap it up by Friday, and let's move on. <laughs> and, you know, look, I couldn't agree with you more. we got to get through with it, but, but we're not going to be done by Friday. You didn't hear me. I said, wrap it up. And, you know, after a few exchanges where I genuinely made an effort to be polite, maybe surprising, I, 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 I said to him, well, if that's the decision of the audit committee, we're done. Yeah. He said, what do you mean we're done? I said, we resign. Hmm. And, you know, we concluded the investigation. We weren't friends anymore, but, but <laughs> you know, that, and, and that you will face. Sandra? Um, my advice to the young lawyers is advice that I got, which is you have to, you cannot be superficial in the practice. You have to go deep. Um, and that means deep in the weeds on the facts, deep in the law, go to these conferences. Um, and also, don't be a sycophant, to your point, to your client. That's not your role. I, I would say, picking up on what Bill said, it, look, in, if, if you've been in the defense bar for a while, you know how to represent someone in an SEC investigation. The biggest challenge that I think I've faced is, are in client management in, in the way that Bill was talking, helping people to understand what the enforcement process is. It's not intuitive at all. Um, and uh, and what the likely range of, of outcomes is without overselling the upside or the downside. And, and 
that um, nothing in law school prepares you for that. Um, a few crazy SEC chairs may have done something to help prepare you for it. But um, understanding the client, understanding the client's business, understanding how decisions are made there, and it's going to be different for every uh, every client. Th that, to me, is one of the biggest challenges of all. And, and frankly, I learn a lot from my corporate partners who spend time in boardroom and dealing with clients in, in a different way at how to manage that process. And I took all of your time. <laughs> I guess just very quickly, um, just understand that even with the best of your pre preparation and the best lawyering, with internal investigations, there are just always inherent tensions. And sometimes you do end up with a situation where you've really done your best, um, but management just you know shuts it down. And it's sort of a very painful thing to go through, but um, you know those things happen too. It sounds like it's going to be easy. It's this independent investigation. I get to just really figure out what happened here. But there's a lot going on. You know, and a lot of different dynamics within the organization that can sometimes, you know, stop you along the way. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.